Hey guys, um, so today this is going to be my long lecture about hematological disorders, also known as blood disorders, and there will also be some stuff about blood transfusion as well. So um, this is a longer video of all the blood disorders. I do have shorter videos um, that kind of break things down or simplify them a little bit more. So I'll be talking a little bit more in these. So if you're looking for shorter videos, um, go to unit two and start looking for um, some of the blood disorder videos. So let's get started. So let's first talk about anemia in general. So what is anemia? So anemia is any time that I have not enough, um, so a shortage or a lack of supply or not good quality red blood cells. So sometimes I'm just not making a quantity that's sufficient to help meet my needs. And other times it's that I'm making them, but they don't, they're not actually good red blood cells. So kind of think of it like a factory that, you know, sometimes they're making something on mass supply and sometimes their machine breaks down, it's not making enough, or sometimes their machine's making some, but they're not turning out the product that they need in order to do the whatever they're trying to do. And so, you know, the important thing to, to remember here is what is the point of red blood cells or why do, why do I even care? Who cares about anemia? Why do I need red blood cells? And, you know, red blood cells are so key to help to get oxygen and nutrients to your tissues. Um, <clears throat> so if I have not enough or not good quality, I'm not going to be able to get oxygen and the other needed nutrients to my tissues, which is kind of a big deal because oxygen is just the main nutrient you need to survive, you know? <laughs> so anyway, um, so causes of this can be, um, blood loss, like, you know, so it can be even that I, it's not that I don't, I'm not making enough, um, red blood cells. It can be that I'm losing, um, too many, like maybe I've, I was in a car accident, I had surgery, or for some other reason, I'm losing blood cells somewhere. Um, and so therefore, I don't have enough. It can also be impaired production. So when, like I was bringing up, like maybe there's something wrong with my, um, uh, in my bone marrow that's causing me to not make enough red blood cells. Um, and we'll talk about this, but all blood, uh, all blood cells uh, sorry, um, red blood cell. Well, yeah, that's like, I would say, yeah. I mean, every, it really comes down to like vitamins and nutrients is what I'm trying to bring up. So like most types of anemia come down to like, I might be missing something in my diet. Um, so, um, you know, effectively, um, I could be not making as much cause I don't have the supplies necessary. So going back to that, kind of think of that, like factory machine example, imagine I have this factory or machine that's supposed to be making something. If I don't have all the supplies to make the product that I need to, I'm not going to be able to make the product. Um, so it's the same when it comes to red blood cells. If I don't have all of the supplies and if I don't have the supplies, cause I'm not eating the nutrients that I need or getting the, um, or I, I'm just, I don't have the nutrients that I need in my body, um, then I'm not gonna be able to produce um, the beautiful red blood cells. Um, I also could have, there's disorders where I'm like losing more because I'm breaking them down. Um, so this could be as a result of hemolysis and other stuff like that, but there's a variety of conditions where you're breaking down too many blood cells. Um, we diagnose it based on a CBC or complete blood count to see, um, you know, we look uh, specifically at that red blood cell count. And usually we are also looking at that hemoglobin because remember the hemoglobin is the ability to actually, um, that's like, the, that's the, um, the hemoglobin is what carries the oxygen to your um, tissues and stuff like that. Um, reticulocyte count, that's like the baby blood, the baby red blood cells. And so it's like, how many baby red blood cells do I have? It's really helpful because it helps tell me, am I losing too many or am I not making enough? If I don't have a, a lot of baby red blood cells, then there's going to be an issue. Um, there's obviously an issue with my production. Like there's something wrong in my bone marrow, et cetera, where I'm not making enough. And then there's a peripheral blood smear, which is where they look at your blood cells and they want to look at the size. So they can tell a lot about anemia just by looking at them. They can say, are they big? They have a lot of big red blood cells Are they tiny red blood cells. You know, what's off about them is because remember, like I said, it could be not good quality red blood cells. So maybe I have plenty number wise, um, but they just, there's something off about the way that they're being produced. There's something they're missing. So like I said, the big problem at the end of the day, not enough, not good quality red blood cells, hypoxia, lack of tissue, um, oxygenation, et cetera. So what does a patient with anemia in general look like? Um, it can differ depending on the type of anemia, but like kind of the general, when you think anemia, you should think about this patient is pale. They may be weak. They can be tired, um, short of breath. And these are all the signs of poor perfusion. I'm pale because red blood cells, they help to um, give you that nice pink appearance that you should have um, in your skin, unless you're genetically more pale and that's okay too. I'm weak and tired. I don't have the nutrients and the oxygen that my tissues need to complete activities 
Um, so therefore, I'm going to be more weak and tired and short of breath because I'm not getting oxygen to my tissues. I have less, I have not enough supplied to meet the demand that my body has. So um, there are different levels of anemia. I don't want you to get too caught up on this because we're not going to test you over and be like, hey, their hemoglobin is seven point blah, blah, blah. You know, um, what exactly are their symptoms going to be? Because they can vary. Um, some people can live at a hemoglobin of six and feel great and feel like everything's fine. Um, other people, they're at a hemoglobin of 10 and they're like, oh, I can't breathe. So, I mean, everyone's a little different, but just kind of keep in mind, like, you know, I always tell my students um, when we're in clinical, like if I, if you're telling me like, Ooh, they have a they have a critically low hemoglobin and it's 11. I'm really not that concerned. <laughs> you know, most of the time we don't even treat um, a low hemoglobin until it gets like less than seven in most hospitals. Um, so this is just to kind of give you a gauge. So like a lot of students they struggle with remembering, and I'll talk in a different PowerPoint about the normals and stuff for hemoglobin. Um, but generally, like I say, a good way to remember it is somewhere in between like 12 to 14, 12 to 16. It's different men versus women, but if you kind of think like 12 to 16, that'll help give you a good range to kind of consider about, about where it should be. Um, and so when it comes to, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, when it comes to patients that have low hemoglobin, usually it takes a while um, before they're going to, uh, like it takes them getting so low before they're really going to start experiencing symptoms. So that's more what I want you to get here is just that they have to kind of get to a certain place before they're really going to start feeling or experiencing this. So I, like I said, like at a 10 to 12, that's only a little bit below normal. They most likely are going to be asymptomatic. Like, I mean, I'm sure there's times that, um, what do you call, I, I would say I, there's a very rare time that I look at my CBC and it's actually normal. Um, but <clears throat> let's say that it's a patient comes in hemoglobin of 11. Most likely they're not like, oh my God, my hemoglobin's 11. I feel horrible. Um, but you know, they may feel some symptoms with exertion, et cetera, if they are, um, if they have that. Um, once we're getting down to like a moderate anemia, which is like around a six to a 10 for their hemoglobin, at rest, they may have symptoms. Again, they may be fine. They may not even notice it at all. Everyone's going to be a little different, but just kind of understanding the gauge of this. And then usually severe is when we're getting like less than six. That's when they're really going to start usually showing some symptoms. It's very rare for a patient to have a hemoglobin um, less than seven and not be experiencing some sort of sign like low blood pressure, change in their breathing, et cetera. But it does happen because some people chronically live with anemia. So um, it just kind of depends on the patient. So how do we fix it? Um, anemia in general, we always want to correct the cause. So there's lots of different types of anemias um, for my school. And if, um, if you're watching, you go to a different school, you might have to know other anemias, um, but we focus on iron deficient anemia, aplastic anemia, and then we talk about polycythemia vera when it comes to um, blood disorders. Um, <clears throat> so, but you might need to know others if you go somewhere else. But those are the only three that you need to focus on. So again, we have to figure out what the cause is. That's why we do that peripheral blood smear. We also do labs to see maybe what nutrients that they're missing and stuff like that and then supplement vitamins is needed. If they have a problem that they're not making enough red blood cells, we can give what's called erythropoietin or EPO. Think of this as like a cheerleader. This is something that my kidneys produce and the kidneys, um, it's, it's kind of, it's a hormone that tells the bones to make more blood cells, specifically red blood cells. Um, so um, if I'm having trouble making enough blood cells, I can give erythropoietin and that can help stimulate to make more blood cells. Of course, if I'm low enough, I may need blood transfusions. Not everyone's going to need a blood transfusion. Like I said, normally we don't replace blood unless their hemoglobin is less than seven or if they're, depending on if they're symptomatic or not. Um, <clears throat> I talked about the vitamins, like we're going to replace whatever's missing. They may need oxygen therapy to help support them, to help meet that demand that the supply that we have is not meeting. Um, and then we're going to teach them what's called energy conservation techniques is we're going to tell them to balance rest and activity because for these patients, it's just, they don't have enough supply to maybe do the regular activities that they were doing before. So they may need more breaks, et cetera. Um, overall, I'm going to teach them about diet and lifestyle changes, just depending on which type of anemia they have, there might be different teaching needed. So now we're going to start going into the individual types of anemia. So first we have what's called iron deficient anemia. So for this type of anemia, the problem is, is I don't have an ingredient that I need to make red blood cells. And the ingredient I'm missing is iron. Um, iron is a crucial ingredient to make um, red blood cells. So if I don't have enough iron, I'm not going to be making as many red blood cells because I don't have the supplies. Um, a lot of times it's due to like people not taking in enough iron in their diets. Um, 
<coughs> sorry, once I get started talking. Um, then um, it also can be due to um, them having um, issues with not absorbing iron right, um, or like if they got the wrong um, type of blood product, they can't have hemolysis. But it's also really common in um, what do you call it, women that are in their younger years, their reproductive um, years. It's really common for them to get it because of blood loss, because every month we get this great visitor known as our period that we lose so much blood. So sometimes it's just from the blood loss alone. Um, and then sometimes a combination of that and the poor diet that um, leads women, especially young women, to be more at risk for this type of anemia. So uh, many people um, do not even know they have iron deficient anemia. Sometimes people find out they have anemia, like iron deficient anemia or anemia problems when they try to donate blood and they're trying to do that little drop on the finger and then they're like, wait, why can't I donate? And it's their hemoglobin slow and they go to their doctor and find out they have iron deficient anemia. Um, <clears throat> they may have the classic symptoms, the pale, weak, tired, short of breath, and they also can have more specific symptoms. And for these patients, um, like the ones, like there's a variety of more specific symptoms, but I think the ones that stand out the most to me, the ones I'm highlighting here are ones going around stuff around your mouth. So you can have glossitis, which is inflammation of the tongue, or you can have, I'm going to probably say this really bad, shellitis, maybe inflammation of the lips. Um, so they can kind of have like complain of a burning sensation on their tongue, inflammation around their mouth. Um, so they may or may not have those symptoms, but those are the ones that are more specific to iron deficient. So it's really important when we're um, lo looking at anemias to look at diagnostic studies, because um, there's definitely going to be some questions on your exam about anemia labs. So definitely want to maybe make some flashcards um, or work specifically to kind of um, better understand these labs. So let's look at iron deficient. What is it going to look like? Well, of course, they're going to have signs of anemia. Their hemoglobin is going to be decreased. Um, but the, the more important thing that's going to be specific for iron deficient is there's going to be signs of iron deficiency. So um, actual iron, of course, is going to be low. So if we drew a serum iron level, it's going to be low. Um, the iron storage, um, what do you call it, um, uh, which is what's called ferritin, is going to be low. Um, and so uh, what do you call it, um, if I have more iron, I'm going to have more ferritin because I'm going to, if I have more iron, I need more places to store it. <clears throat> if I have less iron, um, I'm going to have less ferritin. So pretty much ferritin, it, it works off feedback with iron. So um, in order to have more ferritin, I have to have more iron. On the other hand, something that this one, I always, um, you know, this one's a little bit more confusing to some students. We have what's called a total iron binding capacity. And I consider these like iron parking spaces. So there's iron storage, but there's also this, um, this iron binding capacity that we have in our body. And this is going to be high um, with um, when we have iron deficiency. So this is all the labs are low, except for the total iron binding capacity. <laughs> And here's the best way I can explain it. With the iron storage, the ferritin, um, <clears throat> effectively, um, what do you call it? Like I said, it works on a feedback loop. So I have to have iron to have more ferritin. The, the parking spaces, they just exist. There's these parking spaces where iron can hang out. Um, they're gonna be high or my total ability to bind iron in these parking spaces is gonna be high because there's not a lot of iron. So when I have more art iron, there's going to be more occupied parking spaces. When I have less iron, there's going to be more parking spaces open. So kind of think of this like, um, what do you call it, um, at our school, um, when there's parking spaces. So um, what do you call it, um, when there is more students, um, there's going to be more parking spaces that are being used because more students need the parking spaces. But as the semester goes on, as students, um, you know, start to drop out or, um, you know, they have different responsibilities or they lose their motivation. There is less students coming to campus. And when there's less students, there is more parking spaces open. So that's kind of the loop that is there. So think of the TIBC as parking spaces. There's going to be more parking spaces available because there's less iron around. We think of ferritin. This is something that works hand in hand. Um, what do you call them, uh, with the, um, the iron. So you have to have iron in order to have ferritin. So hopefully that's not too, too confusing, um, but um, effectively everything's going to be low except for my total iron binding capacity, which is going to be high because I have plenty of parking spaces open because there's no iron around to take up those parking spaces. Um, they may also have signs of blood loss, like the occult stool, et cetera, and we'll ask women, of course, about their, um, you know, menstrual cycles, stuff like that. So... 
how do we treat it? We always treat it by going towards the cause. Um, <clears throat> so for um, iron deficient anemia, um, usually we're going to need to get to the bottom of things. If they have blood loss because of their period, obviously we cannot stop their period, but they need, may need um, help replacing their iron and they may at some point need a blood transfusion if it's indicated. But most of the treatment for iron deficient anemia is replacing the iron. Um, it can take up to two to three months to replenish iron stores and get all those parking spaces filled up, et cetera. Um, they may need lifelong therapy if it's something they just chronically cannot take in enough or they're not absorbing it. So some good dietary sources of iron are gonna be things like beef, spinach, beans, shellfish, or anything that's iron fortified. And a lot of pastas and cereals are iron fortified. So definitely encourage those. <clears throat> so let's talk about administering iron. So um, iron, literally, when you get it, it, it looks, it's black. And so um, you're going to be worried about this staining stuff. If you're giving it IV, you're going to be worried about it staining your clothes or the patient's skin, et cetera. If you're giving it orally, um, it um, like liquid iron, it can stain the teeth like in this picture. So you have to be super careful when giving it. Um, <clears throat> if we're giving it orally liquid, like um, we always want to give it diluted through a straw to decrease staining of the teeth. Um, so let me talk about iron absorption. Iron is best absorbed on an empty stomach. Um, when I say empty stomach, no food. So it's best to take it one hour before meals. But here's the thing. It causes a lot of GI side effects. So a lot of people don't tolerate it. So sometimes people do have to take food. But just know in nursing school world, we want the perfect picture. And so for these patients, we would prefer them to take it on an empty, excuse me, one sec. <coughs> empty stomach. I'm sorry, I can't breathe today. Um, so take it on an empty stomach like an hour before meals. But here's the thing. It does get absorbed better when taken with vitamin C. So in other words, if they take like a glass of orange juice with it, not food, but um, vitamin C like liquids, it can help them to better absorb the iron. So it's overall preferred to take it like empty stomach with vitamin, some sort of vitamin C liquid usually and uh, for best absorption. So... Um, aside from that, you do want to tell them that they might have GI side effects, um, like nausea and stuff like that, but that also because of what it's the color and what it's made of, it can change their stools to a black or tarry color. Um, so just warn them that, cause it can be pretty scary if you start pooping black stuff. Um, so you definitely want to warn the patient about the fact that they might poop some weird black stuff. Um, it's preferred to be given orally, but it can't be given sub Q or IV if needed.